Um, this evening, I have the great pleasure of introducing one of UAW's talented researchers, Dr. Philip Byrne. Um, he's from the Evolution and Assisted Reproduction Lab at UOW. He's been working on developing sophisticated assisted reproductive technologies to help threaten species of frogs, um, certain frog breeds. Sorry. Now I'll hand you over to Phil. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, everyone. So frogs are the sexiest animals in the world. They attract their mates using a diversity of sexual signals, ranging from pungent pheromones through to spectacular visual displays and all manner of bizarre vocalisations. They have seven known sexual or amplectant positions and 39 different ways of reproducing, which is more than any other animal group in the world. Frogs breed in strange places. They breed in every type of freshwater body you can possibly imagine. They breed in the canopies of the tallest trees, in deep underground burrows, and even in self-constructed foam nests. Fertilisation in frogs can be either outside the body, can be external, or it can be internal via intermittent organs in the males. Development in frogs can also occur either directly where offspring develop within egg capsules and then emerge with a fully functional adult form, or indirect where there's a free-living larval stage, a tadpole stage, that then needs to metamorphose into the adult form. The degree and type of parental care in frogs also varies enormously. In some species, parents are extremely caring. In others, they don't offer any care at all. Where parents are extremely caring, they can brood the offspring on their back, in specialised hip pockets, in the vocal sac, or even in the stomach after switching off gastric juices. So why so much reproductive variation? Well, Charles Darwin, of course, provided the answer when he introduced us to his concepts of natural selection and sexual selection. Sexual selection being an evolutionary force that favours traits in individuals that enhances their reproductive success. So as an undergraduate, I became absolutely fascinated by the topic of sexual selection. I read all the possible papers that had been published on, at the time on the topic. And I decided right then and there that I simply had to become a behavioural ecologist or evolutionary biologist. So in 1997, <laughs> I've still got the same biomass of hair, it's just <laughs> migrated to my face. I started a PhD at the University of Wollongong with this guy, Professor Dale Roberts, who had a great beard. I always thought that a great biologist had to have a great beard. And my PhD was really focused on investigating the role of sexual selection in the evolution of mating systems using frogs as model systems. So it was a fantastic time to actually start doing research in this area because in the mid-90s to late-90s, the field of sexual selection was in the midst of a major paradigm shift. Traditional models of sexual selection had long been based on the premise that males, which produce huge numbers of very cheap sperm, millions or even billions of sperm, and generally invest very little in parental care, should increase their reproductive success by mating with as many partners as possible whereas females, which have a limited number of large expensive ova and who generally invest very heavily in protecting and nourishing and nurturing offspring, should increase their reproductive success by being monogamous, but by being highly selective in their choice of mating partners. However, with rapid advances in genetic techniques, it was becoming increasingly apparent that no matter what organism you looked at, whether it was a bed bug or a blue whale, Scientists were discovering that females were having their eggs fertilised by multiple males, a mating system that we refer to as polyandry. So this revelation triggered somewhat of a radical and rapid reassessment of the roles of the sexes in reproduction. And quickly, the evolution of polyandry became one of the most compelling questions in the field of behavioural ecology, and still is today. This somewhat Darwinian puzzle triggered a wave of theoretical research attention. Pretty much all of these models, however, were based on the very simple concept of risk reduction. The idea that by spreading risk of reproductive failure, females could elevate their reproductive success. So there was really two broad categories of models that were proposed. The first was that females could benefit themselves by either ensuring against mating with a partner who was going to be a poor father, or ensuring against mating with a male who was infertile or sperm depleted. 
But it was also argued that females could gain indirect genetic benefits for their offspring if polyandry and multiple paternity enhanced genetic diversity of offspring and safeguarded against environmental perturbations, or if polyandry enhanced genetic quality by safeguarding against a male or a female mating with a sire that is genetically inferior, genetic dud if you will, um, closely related or genetically incompatible. So when I started my PhD, I was very interested in testing all of these different theoretical models. And a West Australian frog, the West Australian quacking frog pictured here, provided a great opportunity to do this. This species breeds in winter in very, very shallow pools of water that form after the big low pressure systems move through the southwest corner. And the species also has simultaneous polyandry. So you can see here a female in the light brown embraced or amplexed by two males, one dorsally and one ventrally, and there's a third male sidling up next to them. So one of the first things I did when I started my PhD was use genetic tools to test if there was multiple paternity, and just as predicted, there was. I then was really interested in testing all the different competing theoretical models. So the first thing I did was look for paternal care. Males don't offer any at all. They offer their sperm and then take off, never to be seen again. I then tested to see if females could have their fertilisation success increased, and they didn't. To the complete contrast, they actually had massive reductions in fertilisation success by mating with multiple males. I then looked for genetic benefits and did all manner of quantitative genetic studies to try and tease apart whether there could be any flow-on benefits to the female's offspring. There were absolutely none at all. So a little disheartened that I hadn't actually found any benefits, I grabbed the video camera and headed out into the field to try and work out what was going on. And pretty much spent the next three years with a uh, handy cam crawling through the mud all winter long. But I discovered some fascinating things about this system. So in this system, the density of males varies enormously within and between nights. So on some nights, you just get one, maybe two males per metre squared. On other nights, you get 40, 50, even 60 males in just one metre squared. It's just an absolute carpet of frogs out at these breeding sites. And on these nights with the higher densities, the males had to compete brutally and violently to gain access to one of these small little ponds to breed in. The biggest, toughest males actually got to call from these ponds, but the loser males had to actually adopt an alternative mating strategy. What they did, was sneakily remained very quiet next to the calling male, and then as the female approached, tried to intercept her. More often what they'd do is actually let the female mate with the calling male, and then just as egg release commenced, they'd flip over onto their back in a very stereotype fashion, wiggle underneath the mating pair and amplex the female eventually and gain a share of paternity. So an incredible alternative mating tactic. Other satellites would then join in as well, as sometimes would some of the dominant males, and you'd end up with these mating balls. So here a female being amplexed by three males. So in these situations, reduced fertilisation success was occurring simply because the males were getting their flippers in the way of the other males while they re released their sperm. Often as well, the females would be killed, drowned by the competing males. So here we had a system where there wasn't any adaptive benefits to the females at all of having multiple paternity. And in fact, there are enormous costs. So polyandry was driven, being driven by males, forcing copulation against females, best evolutionary interests. So I was a little bit disappointed that I'd gone to all this effort to try and find some evidence for some of these amazing adaptive models and hadn't found any. So then I was very keen to do this. So I applied for funding in every way I possibly could to see if I could get some money to travel the world and try and find some of these benefits. And the commercial adage sex sells seems to hold water because a whole bunch of these applications came off and I got to spend the best part of the noughties travelling the world studying the sex lives of frogs. <laughs> it was a great time. <laughs> and I also made some interesting discoveries. So this frog here was one that I did some work with. I'm just going to talk about two species that I worked with during this time. This is the brown toadlet, Cerophrony bibrini. It occurs up and down the south coast here. In this species, the male builds a little terrestrial nest site and calls his heart out to try and attract a female to the nest. The females then are attracted to the nest and lay their eggs in the dry dirt, but then they do something amazing. They'll then go and mate with up to eight different males partitioning their eggs between up to eight different nest sites. 
This was an exciting finding for me because it stood as the most extreme case of sequential polyandry ever reported in a vertebrate species. Got some great press all around the world, particular, particularly in India of all places. <laughs> so what the females were doing here was really ensuring against putting all their eggs in one basket. Putting all their eggs in a nest that wouldn't flood properly and lead to the desiccation of the embryos. This was actually a novel benefit of polyandry, one that hadn't been considered by any of the theoretical models. This is another species that I worked with. This is the African uh, tree frog, Chiromantis zamprolina. These guys have an absolutely fascinating, fascinating reproductive biology. Males and females pair up on tree branches overhanging water and they construct these foam nests that they release their gametes into. After five days, the gametes will drip from the, or the tadpoles will drip from the nest into the water body below. So in these guys, there's a lot of polyandry going on. More than 90% of matings involve multiple males. And you can see in the picture below, here's an amplectin pair, and there's all these other males lined up next to them, next to them releasing sperm into the, uh, into the nests. So in these guys, I discovered that there was multiple paternity as well. And I also discovered that there was um, a whole lot of benefits to the females, thank goodness. The first benefit I found was that in this system, by mating with multiple males, females actually elevated their fertilisation success. And the reason for this is there was a whole lot of infertile males in the system or sperm depleted males. A lot of the males have been out helping make these nests night after night and they'd run out of sperm. Another benefit I found in this system was that just as predicted, by mating with multiple males and having multiple paternity, females produce better kids. On average, they got an in increase of 15% survivorship of their clutch by having multiple paternity. An exciting result because it was some of the first evidence for genetic benefits of polyandry. But I also discovered another novel benefit in this system. In this system, in the five days it takes for tadpoles to hatch from the nests, the nests are highly susceptible to desiccation. You get a lot of hot, dry winds move through Africa. So in this system, polyandry, or females that were polyandrous, actually had a lot lower chance of their nests failing. And this is why. Hopefully it plays. have to talk you through it. Okay, so here we have a female returning to her nest site. She's just dropped down into the water body below and rehydrated her bladder so she can use the water and the overducal secretions to make the nest. Here you've seen the original male, the one that was with her before, re-amplex. The incredible thing is that none of the other males try to compete to amplex her the way you did see in Crinia georgiana. Instead what they do is line up orderly in an orderly fashion next to the female and vigorously and synchronously beat their back legs to help the female make this big, wonderful nest. So by the males assisting with the female in this fashion, the female could actually have a nest that wasn't going to desiccate. So again, another really interesting novel benefit of polyandry. So as well as being really interested in the causes of polyandry, the evolutionary causes, I was very interested in some of the outcomes, some of the outcomes for reproductive traits of both sexes. Polyandry is a really interesting phenomenon because it leads to another phenomenon we call sperm competition. As the name suggests, the competition between the sperm of multiple males to fertilise the eggs of a single female. Now, sperm competition has been the subject of considerable game theory modelling, and all of these models are generally based on the simple assumption that sperm competition proceeds like a lottery. So the more tickets the male buys in the lottery, the more sperm he puts in, the greater the chance he has of winning, the greater the chance he has of fertilising eggs. So based on these um, models, these game theory models, two main predictions have come out. The first is that males that are in a system with a whole lot of sperm competition, a whole lot of polyandry, should evolve bigger testis because the testes are, of course, the machinery that makes sperm. And they should also evolve sperm with longer tails, which are effectively the motor for the sperm that helps the, the sperm, in theory, win the race to fertilise. So I tested these ideas in a bunch of Australian frogs, over 180 species, so, and in two families, the Mybotrachids, which are the ground frogs, and the Hylids, which are the tree frogs. And what I discovered was in both families, there was a strong 
correlation between risk of sperm competition and testis size. In the myobotrachids, it was extremely strong and extremely significant. Looking at sperm traits, I discovered that in the myobotrachids, there was no effect of risk of sperm competition on head length, but a strong positive effect on tail length. So again, just as predicted, in systems with a whole lot of sperm competition, male sperm was evolving. Their tails were getting longer. So if you're still not convinced that frogs are sexy animals, it might help my case if I tell you that David Attenborough thinks they are the sexiest. <laughs> I had the pleasure of meeting Sir David in South Africa when he and his team were there for the making of life in cold blood. And after plying David with two bottles of red wine, I popped the big question. The one any young naturalist that met David for the first time would ask. <laughs> I said, David, old boy, what do you think the sexiest animal in the world is? And without hesitating, David turned to me and replied, why, Phil? <laughs> the sexiest animal in the world, of course, is the South American monkey frog. And then he went on in great detail, using all of his classic superlatives, to describe how in this species, they use a waxy substance that they can manufacture to rub over every part of their body, <laughs> according to Sir David. And that actually acts as a sun cream. And David thought that was pretty sexy. <laughs> Here's Sir David and I, the next morning, sharing a laugh uh, about the sex lives of amphibians. So despite getting the nod from one of the world's leading naturalists that studying the sex lives of frogs was A-OK, -okay, in 2005, 2006, I had somewhat of an academic crisis. I was becoming increasingly aware, unbelievably, that not everyone in the world was fascinated by frog sex. <laughs> A common question that I was getting is, why would you spend your life watching frogs have sex? And of course, there's no easy answer to that one. So three events really changed my research direction. The first, when I was at a university to the south, which will remain nameless, I got busted by the IT guys one morning. I had the head of the IT department and a representative from Human Resources come and knock on the door, demanding to know why the vast majority of my Google searches had been for terms such as multiple male mating and <laughs> sperm competition and so on and so forth. I could argue my way out of it pretty easily. I'd signed a contract with sperm competition in the title. The second was that I attended the World Congress of Herpetology, and to my surprise, even though there were 6,000 delegates there, no one was really talking about frog sex. I was shocked. What they were talking about was an evil chytrid fungus that was sweeping the world, decimating frog populations. This was a major biodiversity crisis. More than 30% of the world's 6,000 odd amphibians we're now in a really, really bad way. And the third thing that happened was on a return trip to my old lab to catch up with my old supervisor, Dale Roberts, I met Dr. Amy Siller. Amy was doing a PhD at the time developing assisted reproductive technologies. She was extremely passionate about frog conservation and conservation in general. And what Amy was doing was giving nature a helping hand by using hormones to stimulate males and females to release sperm and eggs and then combining them together in a petri dish to uh, generate viable offspring. IVF for frogs, if you will. Chatting with Amy, I quickly discovered that she was being faced with a couple of challenges. The main one was there was very high species specificity in how the different species were responding to hormone treatment. So in some species, they responded well. In others, not so well. So this made me question whether knowledge of the evolution of mating systems might actually be able to be used to assist with the development of these assisted reproductive technologies. So one of the first things Amy and I started to do was to see if we could actually predict responses to hormone treatment. And this is what we did. We took two species. We took our old friend, the quacking frog, the one with giant testes, high levels of sperm competition. And we looked at the quabbery frog, the southern quabbery frog, Australia's most critically endangered species, not just frog species, vertebrate species. We predicted that the quacking frog with their high basal circulating levels of androgens and large testes would respond really quickly to hormone treatment, whereas the quabbery frog should respond extremely slowly. And this is just what we found. This is a 
figure from Amy's PhD thesis, which looks at time against number of sperm released. And in quacking frogs, given a shot of the hormones, within about 15 minutes, the males are just spewing out the sperm. And it's not that dissimilar for females either, except that they're spewing out eggs, of course. You look at the quabbery frogs, and they take days just to release a couple of hundred sperm. So if we hadn't predicted that these guys, without polyandry and then without sperm competition, would take so long to respond to hormones, we would have never stayed awake for three days straight trying to collect sperm from these guys. It's lucky that we did, because we got to start developing IVF for this system. So in 2011, I was fortunate enough to secure a research position and a lectureship uh, here at the University of Wollongong. And so both Amy and I moved here and we married up our research skills. We also married up our life skills. We got married. <laughs> and we formed the Evolution and Assisted Reproduction Laboratory. And we've been really fortunate to attract a whole bunch of really incredible young, fired up biologists uh, to the lab who are now doing incredible things. We also started working closely with a number of industry partners. Most of these guys just walked in. Dave Hunter and Mike McFadden up the back. <laughs> So these guys, in, um, in collaboration with Zoos Vic and the Amphibian Research Centre, have basically been spearheading Australian frog conservation for the last couple of decades, and they're doing incredible things. So we considered ourselves really fortunate enough to be able to team up with these guys and start doing some good things. We secured some linkage funding, and very quickly we've been able to establish some excellent research facilities here at UOW. We've got all these wonderful automated systems for rearing tadpoles. We've got uh, computer-assisted um, sperm analysis machines, so anything you want to know about sperm, we can tell you. We can talk about that later if uh, you want to <laughs> pop over and fund our research program. And we've also recently um, had buildings and grounds over at UOW through Mark Spence help us build a whole bunch of frog ponds that we're going to use for research. So things are really happening. And the lab has three broad aims. The first is to develop ART for endangered species. The second is to understand what makes a viable frog. And the third is really to try and bolster natural populations by releasing these ART-generated individuals back into the wild. So what have we been up to recently? Well, a whole bunch of things. We're continuing to work with sex cells. Um, we're doing a lot of work with common species as well as critically endangered species. And just as predicted, we're discovering that the species mating system is really helping us predict how the species will respond to hormone treatment. We've also been investigating the influence of fertilisation um, environment and sperm performance, and we're discovering that osmotic environment, you might think of it just as the amount of salinity in the environment, in the freshwater body, has a big influence on sperm performance. So frogs, they, when they release their sperm into the environment, the sperm aren't swimming at all. They need to get an osmotic shock to trigger them to start moving. So what we were discovering was that the optimal osmolality to trigger sperm motility was differing between species. You'd expect that. But we we're also discovering, discovering that it was varying enormously within species. So here's a study that we did recently with one of Australia's most abundant and common frogs, Crinia signifera. Craig Dunn's in the room. This was for his honours work. And we discovered that sperm are adapting to their local environments. We discovered that sperm activate best in water with an osmolality that reflects that of the local habitat. So this provided evidence for either genetic adaptation of the sperm, really exciting, or the sperm were actually able to have plasticity in their physiology and how they respond to the environment. So it was a really important finding because it's made us start thinking about how we actually treat the sperm during our IVF experiments. We've also been working out ways to store sperm. Lisa Keogh, who's also here tonight, has been working closely with Amy on short-term sperm storage. And this is critical for frogs, because, particularly in an ART context, because the males respond really quickly to hormone treatment. They're quite trigger-happy. Whereas the females take a bit longer to release their eggs. So we have a, an asynchrony and gamete release. And the way to get around this is potentially store the sperm of the boys until the eggs become available. So Lisa's been doing all sorts of amazing stuff looking at the influence of temperature and antibiotics and even stimulants such as caffeine on, uh, on sperm performance during short-term sperm storage. And we're also now starting to dabble with cryopreservation of sperm to see if we can preserve them well into the future. Another thing we've been doing is investigating what actually makes a good frog. And just like beer, there's two important factors, ingredients and environment. Unlike beer, when we're talking about 
uh, ingredients for frogs, what we're really talking about is genetic quality. So we've been really interested in how factors such as good genes or compatibility genes will influence the viability of frogs. And we've been using Amy's ART tools to do these wonderful um, massive uh, quantitative genetic breeding experiments where we can get a bunch of males and a bunch of females and cross them in every possible pairwise combination and then look at the viability of the offspring. What we're discovering in a bunch of species that we've looked at already, there's high levels of incompatibility. So some guys are fantastic with some females, but they're complete duds with others in terms of the quality of the offspring they'll produce. Why incompatibility? Well, we've done a lot of research over the last 10 years in the, <clears throat> in the field as well. And we're discovering in a bunch of the toadlet species that they come back to the same sites year after year after year. Toadlets are great. They've got unique ventral patterns, so we can identify who's who based on their markings. This is JC. Fortunate for him, he lived a long time. Still seems to be alive today. So what we're discovering, these guys are returning to the same site. The sites have high levels of, or low levels of genetic variation. And as a result, working out who to pair with her, who is absolutely critical. We're also discovering that between populations, we're getting high levels of failure. And the reason for this is the populations are diverging really, really quickly. What about rearing environment? Well, as you might expect, a whole bunch of factors are really important. Dion Gilbert down at Zoos Vix beams working with a boar boar frog. Now, these guys only occur on one mountaintop in Victoria anymore. They're critically endangered. Brian Kearney's been working with the green and golden bell frog, and Steph Courtney Jones has been working with the striped marsh frog. And they've been making some great discoveries that rearing temp, substrate, salinity, amount of food, and all the interactions between these factors play a key role in making a good frog. We're also discovering that type of food is really, really important. So we've been doing a lot of work lately looking at antioxidants. As you all know, antioxidants are touted as the super molecule for humans. And it, also, it appears that this is also the case for frogs. So antioxidants quench free radicals, which are unstable molecules that can cause damage to cells as well as DNA. And one powerful antioxidant group we've been working with lately is the crotinoids. This is a group of over 600 compounds that are made by plants. The animals can't make them, so they have to get them in their diet. And we've looked at the effect of a broad spectrum carotenoid on a whole range of fitness determining traits, particularly in the quabri frog. Emma McInerney has been working um, tirelessly with the quabris over the last few years and discovered that feeding them carotenoids actually makes improves their exercise performance. So, so hopefully this next little video, video works. We'll give it a second. Three, two, one. So this was a fantastic video <laughs> showing a robotic snake that Emma had used to chase a quabri frog down a racetrack. And using this approach, Emma discovered that the quabri frogs that you feed carotenoids are better hoppers. We've also discovered that carotenoids have a big impact on the coloration of the quabri frogs. So you feed them carotenoids and they come out brighter orange. Really interestingly, however, if you don't give them carotenoids at all, on a very basic diet, they still develop some yellow coloration, which suggests that they have the capacity to manufacture their own pigments. We've also discovered quite remarkably that if you feed these frogs carotenoids, the diversity of their skin bacteria increases. Really interestingly, they get a couple of bacteria that are known to have antifungal properties. So this is exciting for us because it suggests that we might actually be able to manipulate diet to improve the immunity of these frogs. The ultimate goal of our work really is to um, achieve successful reintroduction. So Dave Hunter, who's up the back, um, he's been working a lot over the last couple of years to establish these incredible um, ring enclosures, these semi-natural environments out in Kosciuszko Natural, National Park, where the quabri frog, southern quabri frog used to occur. And what we're really trying to do now is ask whether what particular traits are likely to influence reintroduction success of the frogs when we introduce them to these some so-called nursery sites. Mike McFadden, who's also here, has been doing his PhD looking at the influence of life stage on reintroduction success. So is it better to release eggs or tadpoles or sub-adults or, um, or, uh, or adults? 
And we're also interested in whether the brightness of the frogs, which we can improve by feeding them carotenoids, will actually improve their viability post-release. So cobbery frogs, as are a bunch of terrestrial toadlets, are actually toxic, and they signal this toxicity through their bright yellow coloration. So what we've been doing in cobbery frogs and red crown toadlets is putting thousands and thousands of models out into the field and seeing which colours and colour patterns get hit by predators and which ones don't. And it's starting to provide some insights into whether colour might afford these frogs some protection from predators. One of the last things we've been doing is asking whether frogs have personality. So Shannon Kelleher, who's also here for our honours project, has discovered in the quabbery frogs that some individuals are repeatedly more active, more exploratory, or even bolder. And we'll see if this little video plays. So here you'll see a quabbery frog that hopefully is about to be attacked by a robotic currawong. Oh, you missed it. It was spectacular. <laughs> so what we're finding in other animals that have personality is that the type of personality they have can have a big influence on reintroduction success, as you might imagine. So if you're reintroducing individuals that are too bold, they might actually be um, exposed to a higher risk of predation. Ones that are more exploratory might actually find the good sites or even find a mating partner. So the next step is to really start asking some of these questions. So just to wrap all this up, I'll finish by saying that frogs have some incredible ways of reproducing. Species all over the world are at risk of extinction. ART, the development of assisted reproductive technology, technologies, is proving to be really useful at assisting with captive breeding of these species. And knowledge of sexual selection is also proving to be really important. Thank goodness, I've now got a reason to go out there and watch frogs do what they do. And really an ongoing concerted effort by uh, zoo managers, by environmental managers um, and researchers, such as many of the wonderful team we have in the room today. With the combined effort of these guys, I'm, I'm personally confident that there's going to be a brighter future for frogs. So I'll leave it there and uh, open the forum for questions. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much. That was incredible. Um, I have a question about the, the very first part of the introduction with the polyandry. Um, we know that there are situations with, you know, patriarch patriarchal, hierarchical systems where you might have one dominant male um, with a harem of females, uh, where you talk about polyandry being quite common. So do you get these hierarchical, patriarchal kind of situations as well with frogs, or is that not something that you, you tend you tend not to. So dominant dominance hierarchies aren't really that common in frogs. Dominant hierarchies tend to evolve in species that are social, where the males and females hang out together all the time. Uh, they form these big groups, and because they're living together, typically because something other than breeding has brought them together, uh, an area with good resources or possibly good nursery sites for offspring in the future. And because they're all living together, they then have to start fighting to uh, gain dominance over territories and potentially mating partners. So in those situations, you actually see these hierarchies form, but you still get sperm competition because there's always sneaky males in the system. Um, you mentioned that you were looking at how uh, <laughs> re reintroducing at different life stages, a tadpole and mammal adult, and testing that. Have you got any result on that? You can ask Mike all about it. He's being very tight-lipped about it at the moment. <laughs> We've actually got a uh, recovery team meeting here for the next two days at UOW, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking all about. So I think the hard, fast answer probably is it's still very early days. And with the quabbery frogs, it takes them uh, males two to three years to reach sexual maturity, and the girls take four to five or even six years. So it's a long-term project trying to work out whether reintroduction of these different life stages will actually work or not. So if I was a betting man, I think Mike would probably say that it's a work in progress. <laughs> so, Phil, you've convinced me that these assisted reproductive technologies are a powerful technique, but how are we going to solve the problem of the degraded habitats into which we're trying to re-release these frogs? 
It's a really good question. I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate question. I'll, I'll leave that to the, uh, to the ecologists. The, uh, I guess the hard, fast answer, the way the ecologists, as you know, are thinking at the moment is the, the only way Ford is conserving massive tracts of land and letting evolutionary processes take place. Because if you think about the threatening processes that have led to the demise of these frogs in the first place, mainly habitat destruction, chytrid fungus, the risk is if you keep releasing them back into the wild, the same threatening processes will just keep taking them out. So we are actually thinking about that, where we've been doing a bunch of work with researchers at James Cook University to see if the quarry frogs can evolve resistance, um, or if whether they can evolve immunity, or at least develop immunity. So you hit them with a fungus, see if they develop immunity, and then you can release them. So in terms of habitat destruction, well, there's no easy um, answer to that one. Um, there's got to be a concerted effort worldwide to try and conserve massive tracts of land. And the benefit of that, of course, is that if you are conserving massive tracts of land, you are potentially conserving evolutionary processes as well and letting the animals respond to their uh, challenges in their environment and hopefully um, evolving in a way that these populations can maintain or at least the lineages can be maintained. So it's the hard-hitting question, that one. The ultimate question, really. So that's, that's the plan with the nursery sites as well, is Dave and his team have tried releasing frogs back into the wild um, without these levels of intervention, and it doesn't seem to be as effective as it has been by setting up these nursery sites. So we're actually confident that by taking this new approach, it'll buy us time, if nothing else, to actually try and work out the best steps forward. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned a few ART techniques that you should respond now. If you had to be bet on one or at least three, maybe what well, might be the most successful, even though you're still researching? The most successful uh, assisted reproductive technology? Yeah, there's a few there. I'm wondering which ones might be more helpful. The one we're most um, confident in at the moment is just using the hormones to actually get the gametes and be able to generate the frogs in the first instance. So there's a a little bit of trial and error at the start when you're trying to refine these protocols, working out the best doses, the best time to actually inject these frogs, and whether you can actually manipulate their basal reproductive state in the first instance um, before we actually have the golden arrows, so to speak. But we're making progress really, really quickly, so we're confident that these tools are definitely the way forward. Okay, are there any other questions? No worries. Well, I'm sure there's a bunch of people I have to buy beers now, so I think uh, we adjourn to the bar. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for coming. I also wanted to let you know that we do two uni in the breweries each year, so if you're interested in joining our mailing list, um, just follow our Facebook page on um, UAW research or come and see me afterwards and I'll add you to the list. But thank you again Phil for such a wonderful talk. No worries. And we really appreciate the time and effort you put into this event. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers.